Now start with our constitutive equations, uh, our next step in continuum mechanics before we move back to the uh, finite element analysis. Let us see what are the things that uh, we are going to look at in continuum, uh, sorry, in constitutive equations. As I had already told you that the constitutive equations are ones which gives us the relationship between state variables. Basically, we are interested in certain stress measures and strain measures uh, and this will be very useful to us of course, to further apply finite element analysis to much more complicated problems. Now, let us look at certain principles that are necessary for uh, constitutive equations. So, this will throw up some more theories on stresses and strains. In other words, what we mean to say is that you cannot just take a stress measure or stress rate measure or strain or strain rate measures and just use it in constitutive equations. Constitutive equations independently have to satisfy certain conditions. Of course, whatever you do with the constitutive equations, they should of course satisfy all our thermodynamic laws as well as the other balance laws we had put in. So, your equations should not in any way hamper uh, the other things that the thermodynamic laws. Apart from that, we have two important principles. One of the most important principle is what is called as material frame indifference. And the second one is what is called as principle of local action and if you want you can add one more called principle of determinism. These two are uh, sort of more technical, we will just state what it is, but we will concentrate on material frame difference much more closely. So, for example, what uh, this principle of determinism says is that determinism, determinism says that is that the, the stress on a body, the current state of stress in a body depends upon the history of motion or deformation okay, of a point. In other words, if you put it like this, say if I am interested to determine what would be the stress at a point in a body at a point in a body rather, then that stress is determined of course uniquely by the history of deformation or motion of this point. Okay. And uh, that if at all there is a, an interaction of other points on, the, on this point, it is restricted to a very, very small neighborhood or infinitesimal neighborhood of this point. So, in other words determinism talks about the history of deformation or history of motion and the local action talks about the effect of a very, very small neighborhood, infinitesimal neighborhood around that point. Okay. So, these are uh, the more technical, so in the sense that these are uh, things which you can understand, but more important thing that we have to understand, have to apply very rigorously is what is called as the material frame indifference or objectivity. What essentially it states, I had said that before, is that when you study any physical 
quantity. This quantity should not be affected or rather I would put it like this decisions based on these quantities should not be affected by the observer. So, the concept of observer is central to the whole of the continuum mechanics. So, it should be independent of the observer. We are going to state later maybe towards the end of the class that it is not that the vector quantities which are measured by two observers are exactly the same that is why I say I put in a clause there, but they have to transform according to certain rules. Now, let us first look at the concept of two observers and then develop this theory of material frame indifference. Now, it is possible that any event in this case an event we had already defined that is an ordered pair of x and t that is in other words a vector x and the time t okay, can be observed by more than one observer. So, let us say that you and I watch an experiment. Okay. It is not necessary that both of us are at the same place, same place with same coordinate system. Okay. You may have you may be at a different position okay, and that is number 1 and you may have a different coordinate system that is number 2 and number 3 is you may not even be stationary. Okay. You can move as you observe or you can rotate or whatever it is. In other words the relationship between you and me may even be time dependent. Okay. If this is the case how does a quantity behave, how does a quantity behave under our observations become important. To put it in a very simple fashion, suppose I am observing stress and you are also observing stress. Okay. Let me say that you are a star observer, say star okay, is what I put for you. Okay. Both of us are observing stress Okay, in a body, the same body undergoing the same type of deformation or not same type, same deformation rather. Okay, both of us are observing this. Okay, you may be just uh, in a trolley and moving out or you may even rotate. But the point is that ultimately when I say that there is going to be yielding, you also have to agree with me that there is going to be yielding. When I say that it is going, there is going to be failure or fracture, you would agree with me that there is going to be fracture. It is not that, it is not that when you observe stress, you can sit in a chair, a revolving chair and then just revolve or rotate your chair and say that the stresses are now increasing. Or in other words, whatever you do should not have any effect on the body, what you are observing on the body. This is in essence the concept of material frame indifference or frame indifference. The quantities that you are observing are indifferent to the frame that you choose in order to observe. So, an event say for example, the unstarred observer can be say let us write this down as say x comma t, this is what we called as event, okay, x chosen from the Euclidean space and t chosen from a real space and usually it is it is the it is written as E cross R, R but we do not worry about that. So, let us say that as another observer, so let me call you as the star observer and let the star observer observe this the same thing as x star comma t star. Let me clarify, let me point it out again that it is not necessary that x should be equal to x star it is not that x is equal to x star, t also need not be equal to t star, we are not talking about that, okay. not the same, but there has to be an allowance for v2 being different. What is that allowance? How do we get this allowance? That is the question or in other words, if I 
tell you what is x closing your eyes can you say what should be your x star can you predict it you can i can i develop a relationship between them and can this relationship stay okay and will that relationship ensure that there is objectivity and in fact material frame indifference is also called as a principle of objectivity it is objective it's not subjective what you observe is objective so it's also called as a principle of objectivity now immediately two things come to comes to our mind when i say that i have to be objective one is that all the observations which are of interest to us or ones which involve a change in length if it followed all the things that we had done okay one of the key things here is that we are interested in change in length so the change in length that you observe or i observe should be the same so in other words the transformations that i have to apply when i want to predict your what you observe should be length preserving transformations should be length preserving transformations say for example i observe two events okay so let me call this events as say x0 comma t0 and let me say that this is say x comma t okay and you observe that same thing and you record these events happening at two different times okay and with two different x's as uh, say x0 star comma say t0 star and x star comma t star suppose you observe in this fashion and uh, sir you observe like this and i observe like this what do we mean by length preserving transformation the lengths are given by say x star minus x0 star okay or rather the norm of it okay should be the same as x minus x0 or in other words that's the first condition i will come to time in a minute okay in other words x star minus x0 star should be equal to qt where q is remember that we had already done this okay length preserving transformations are transformations which are operated by an orthogonal tensor okay into x minus x0 so if the transformations are like this then obviously what's it obviously length is preserved and that that's number 1 number 2 if i look at the difference in times okay which is say t minus t0 star the difference in times should be the same okay or in other words this should be equal to t minus t star so that t minus t0 is equal to t star minus t0 star okay so the time differences are preserved you can write it any way you want you can bring this side and then bring it to the other side so the two things one is the time differences are preserved and the length distance lengths are preserved if these two are preserved then whatever conclusions you and i come to ultimately will be the same yes so why are you taking two different times t not and t yeah that's a good question why am i taking two different times t not and t what we are saying is that they are two different events they are two different events that are taking place at two different times the two different events that are taking place at two different times 
it is not it is not restricted to a body that is say uh, being deformed even then okay deformed with respect to time is a factor is a factor i mean to put it more uh, you know in a you know, more lucid fashion what uh, has been done in uh, some of the continuum mechanics books okay is that suppose you are observing some say you are in a in a ship okay and you have a friend who is in, in another ship right and both of you are observing say a target right so you say for, for example there are warships and some other you know an enemy ship is here now you are looking at the position of this from here and you radio the guy that right now i am seeing this guy at a particular position he also say starts looking at it so this starts moving so after some time say this is the position okay this ship is the movement of the ship here the enemy ship is independent of your observation so ultimately whether you observe it or your friend observes it the distance moved by this target ship should be the same for both of you okay and the time that is required for this motion should time as it moves from here to here should also be the same okay there has to be a relationship between your coordinates and my coordinates that's all in that case it will come t not minus t not star that's what i said so having understood this that same thing yeah either way that is why i said you can bring that this side and then write if i bring this this, this side i'll write this as t star okay and you can write that as t minus t not either way you can t minus t not star is equal to t minus t not oh i put if i not put t zero yeah this is t not obviously okay so either way you can write so the times are the, 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 that's a, the example which i gave you was a very you know naive example but it's uh, nice to understand it but more importantly here we are talking about deformations okay following say points and over a period of time so the times should be the same the distances so these are this are more mathematical representation of the of an event consisting of one from the euclidean space and one from the real space r okay you can rewrite this in fact and let's see what happens if i rewrite this part i can write that as say x star is equal to look at that x star is equal to this side this i'm going to take it to the other side is equal to x0 star minus qt x0 plus qt x qt what is qt in the sense that q this the most important thing here is that this q is a function of time the most important thing is that this q is a function of time so that this ultimately can be written as say x star is equal to c t this whole thing can be written as c t okay x0 is a constant there okay plus q t into x so in other words the length preserving transformation can also be represented in this fashion so what does it mean it means that if you have an x star okay and if i have x what you have measured and what i have measured if these two are relation, related by this kind of equation okay what we have observed is very objective that's what it means okay look at this what is this this can be looked at something like a translation term and this can be looked at something like a rotation term right now let us uh, 
go further and say that let us say that you have a coordinate system obviously all of us observe these events using a coordinate system. Let us say that I have a coordinate system let us written uh, let us say that it is written by E A that is E 1, E 2 and E 3 and you have a coordinate system written as say E A star and obviously your coordinate system and my coordinate system are such that they are related by this Q E A, Q I am just removing T so you can be just writing it as Q okay Q E A. Let us see what this does for our actual coordinates that we measure. So now we know that uh, very simple to find out that x star of course all of them are vectors here tensor x star dot E A star is equal to the coordinate E x A. Okay. So, in other words this is a very straightforward thing which we have done again and again in the last course. So, what we do is that we take this dot product with E A star on this. So, let, let us call this as x star dot E A star is equal to C dot E A star plus Q T x dot E A star. So, in other words this is x a the coordinate of course, a takes the value 1, 2 and 3. So, if I use E 1 star okay, which is the basis E 1 basis of course, there are 3 basis E 1, E 2 and E 3. So, a takes the values from 1, 2 and 3. So, if I put 1 here what I get is the coordinate x 1 that is what we mean. Okay. So, what does it give? This shows that ultimately if I write that as x a star is equal to c dot e a star okay, is the if I when I write c in star coordinate then this can be written as c star okay, or c a star plus how do you write this? You can write that as x dot q transpose E A star and Q transpose E A star is what from our previous expression E A star and E A this becomes E A. So, x dot E A and that can be replaced by x A. So, in other words if we are observing an event which is supposed to be objective then the coordinates what you observe and what I observe are only removed by are only removed by a constant C a okay. they are removed by constant C a star is that clear. Okay. Now, this is there is a there is a subtle difference between this kind of approach and rigid body rotation. Can someone tell what would be the difference? Is it that just a rigid body rotation? Is it that because that is that's also a length preserving transformation? Both of them are very similar there is no doubt about it, okay. but technically they are slightly different in the sense that the coordinates in this case Okay, do not change since the change only by this, but whereas there the coordinates themselves change okay, because coordinates are given by as a position vectors by q t. So, the coordinates change your observer is the same and observers either you can look at it as observer is the same, same and the body is rotating. So, the coordinates of the body are changing as the body rotates. So, this is yeah more technical both of them, but are length preserving transformations. In fact, you can check this as length preserving transformation. For example, you can take say a vector u and u star. Okay. So, please do that u star is 
return say y minus y star minus x star and u can be written as y minus x this is a vector y minus x and say y star minus x star you can check that how y star y star of course happens to change like this y star is equal to c t plus q t y and x star changes like this plus q t x. And from these two you can see that y minus or y star minus x star is equal to q t into y minus x or in other words what it means is that any vector u star okay, can be written as q t u and if a vector transform I am not saying that every vector would transform like that if a vector in fact transforms according to this transformation rule then the vector is objective okay, the vector would result in length preserving transformations. So, point number 1, if I want a vector to be objective, okay, it does not change or I would say, I, I should not say it does not change, but its meaning does not change whether you observe it or I observe it, then that vector has to change according to this fashion or in other words any vector which changes according to this equation is termed as objective, is termed as objective. So, in order to make things clear let us look at a vector like velocity, a vector like velocity. So, let us see what happens when I choose velocity, it is very simple just work it out and you will get very interesting results. Okay. Please uh, look at that, how you can define velocity. So, say for example, x you know how it is defined, x is equal to deformation. So, x dot which is v is chi dot x comma t. Let us see how this transforms. Okay. Now, I have x dot star and x dot. This is what I want to find out how, what is the relationship between the two. If the relationship between the two are said to be objective, then, then they should transform according to this rule. Q of course, a function of t it should transform according to this rule. If the transformation rule is not like this, then that quantity is not objective. So, any decision taken based on a quantity which is not objective depends upon your actions, depends upon your actions. That is what I said that when I talk about stress, the stress has to be or the stress measure which I am looking at should be objective. If it is not, okay, if it is not, then that quantity will be object uh, will be affected by your motions or your actions, right? So let us see what what happens to velocity. Oh, simple. X star is equal to Q T into, sorry, C T plus q t into x, right. C t is a translation, you can review it as a translation term and q t is a rotation term, okay. So, from this you can also write down x from in other fashion as x is equal to q transpose into x star minus c t. 
Now find out what is the relationship between x dot and x dot star. So x dot is equal to x dot is equal to q dot transpose q dot look at that because q is a function of time okay. This is one of the major factors which, which distinguishes it from just a small rotation that you give to the body or to the coordinate system into x minus c t plus q transpose sorry uh, yeah q transpose t into x dot star minus c dot Yeah. Right. So just replace that x dot by v. So that v is equal to n v star. Right. Just multiply throughout by q. multiply by so that q v okay so this becomes q that becomes q okay we know that q q transpose is equal to i so that ultimately you can express v star look at the way i'm going to express v star you can do that it's the next step so v star and, and let me define one more quantity let me define omega define I am saying please note that I am defining omega to be q dot q transpose q dot q q dot q transpose and of course omega is equal to minus omega uh, transpose okay. So for using the principle of our q transpose is equal to q i sorry q inverse. So, I can write down ultimately v star to be very simple just look at this equation you can write that as v star is equal to c dot plus q v plus omega into x star minus c. Now look at this expression. Now I have two terms here c dot term and this term okay, which are additional terms q dot term and c dot term which are additional terms which defines the relationship between v star and v. In other words my relationship should have been just v star is equal to q v my relationship should have been v star is equal to q v but the relationship happens to be now v star is equal to c dot plus q v plus omega into x star minus c. So in other words velocity is not an objective quantity velocity is not an objective quantity it depends upon your motion the way you are going to rotate obviously now you know it's everything you know dawns on you the way you are going to move c dot way you are going to rotate will change the velocity that you observe on a particle right we know this so velocity is not an objective quantity look at acceleration just let us see can you please derive from here differentiate it once more and please write down what would be the relationship between a star and a okay do not check this with respect to time and write down what is the relationship between a star and a it is quite simple 
So, this when I differentiate it becomes A star is equal to C double dot plus Q dot V plus Q A plus omega dot X star minus C plus omega V star minus C dot right I think I am right I have not missed out any terms. Now I am not going to spend time in simplifying it please simplify that I will write, write down the just the final result with whatever we had defined omega please substitute that in a very straightforward substitution. So that I can write A star A star is equal to Q A the first term okay that is this term here plus C double dot plus omega dot minus omega squared omega squared is omega omega so you can find out easily substitute what it is into x star minus c plus into V star minus C dot. Some of you have done multibody dynamics, you may recognize this or if you are going to do it later you will recognize what these are. Okay. The last term here is what is called as the Coriolis component. Okay. So, last term there is what is called as the Coriolis component. The omega squared term is the centrifugal acceleration and the omega dot term there okay, is what is called as Euler accelerations. So, they are different accelerations that exist okay, because of this kind of relative motion. So, again acceleration is not an objective quantity. What does it mean? It simply means that if I use velocities and accelerations as a part of my constitutive equation then I am in trouble, I am in trouble. If I, I cannot definitely say that uh, in a very naive sense that look if the velocity of a particle reaches a particular value then there is going to be failure. If I make a statement like that what does it mean? You can start moving you know sit in a, in a revolving chair or in a trolley just start moving get whatever velocity you want and look at the specimen and then it should break. It is exactly what it means by saying that your quantities should be objective. So, I cannot use velocity I can use acceleration. So, from that sense you will immediately recognize that say Newton's second law of motion is not frame indifferent. Your motions are going to have an effect on the second law. So, second law is not objective or not frame indifferent. Does not mean that we have to we need to throw it out, but we have to keep this in mind very carefully. In fact, many of the laws put certain restrictions, certain restrictions okay, on the way you look at the constitutive equations. Okay, you have to understand that very carefully, but most of the laws that we encounter in constitutive equations are the ones where you would see that they are frame indifferent. Suppose this quantity from here to here, if this quantity happens to be 0, okay, then A star is equal to QA and the acceleration happens to be objective, then we call this transformation or this invariance to be Galilean invariance we call that as Galilean invariance. Okay. So, that is fine this is for a vector, but we are interested in tensors. How does say a second order tensor transform 
So let us call a second order tensor to be say A. How does it transform? So second order tensor can be written as dyadic of two vectors. Say for example, u1 dyadic u2. Of course, the second order tensor can be or should be written as x comma t, x comma t. Now, how does this transform? This means that this is equal to q u1 dyadic q u2 and you can verify this very easily. We have u dyadic a v can be written as u dyadic v a transpose. Okay, this you can di not dyadic v sorry verify it using integral notation. Hence the previous equation let us see how it transforms for start quantity sorry a star I should put here a star is equal to q u1 that is q u2 where a star of course is equal to u1 star dyadic u2. So that a star x comma t can be written as q t u1 dyadic u2 q transpose. So that a star is equal to q t a because that is a q transpose. So, in other words, in other words, we call when we call as the a vector to be objective, then the transformation rule should be like that. And if I call a second order tensor to be objective, then my transformation rule should be like this. Okay. And what happens if it is a scalar? Suppose we are observing temperatures, what would happen to it? Both of us are observing temperatures, common sense, same. same. So if there are scalars like say temperature, then both T star should be equal to T, both of them should be the same. So that is for a scalar. We can extend that, but for the time being, this is enough for us. Scalar, and that is for a vector. And lastly, this is the one which talks about the second order tensor to be objective. We have already seen two quantities velocity and accelerations, which are not objective. We will see that many more quantities which we have come across are either going to be objective or are not going to be objective. Now one of the interesting things that you have to notice is that at all the time put some x small x comma t which means that what we are considering are spatial quantities. In fact, people like uh, Ogden you know, was, a, was an excellent book on nonlinear elasticity. He calls these quantities to be Eulerian objective, Eulerian objective because these quantities are observed in the current coordinate system and hence they are called as Eulerian objective. But if I have to transform this to the original coordinates or reference configuration or if you are looking at Lagrangian quantities, the Lagrangian quantities are we, we are going to see that the references or reference configuration is going to be the same for both the observers. Okay, that is the assumption we make that the reference configuration is the same for both the observers. 
So if you look at say for example a quantity like u okay, which results from our decomposition f is equal to r u then since it is referred to as Lagrangian then u star should be equal to u because both of them belong to the reference configuration. So all those quantities Lagrangian quantities which refer to the reference configuration should be the same or u star should be equal to u. Okay. Is that clear? We will stop here and we will continue with certain other important aspects of objectivity in the next class. Thank you.